Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Thursday, October 18th, 2018. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Let's take a look at solar wind speed sitting at 324.7 kilometers per second with a density of around 4. Still looking at AR2725. A tiny sunspot has reemerged after disappearing for a day. Um, and this was what... Um, Rob was uh, talking to me about earlier today as well. It had it disappeared and then reappeared again. So it hung on just for another day. Sunspot 11. Also, while we're here at spaceweather.com, gorgeous pictures here are some ice pillars. But we also wanted to point out that there is a chance, a 60% chance, of a G1 class geomagnetic storm on October 19th when a stream of solar wind is expected to graze the Earth's magnetic field. And I'll go ahead and show you exactly the coronal hole that is going to be causing that let's take a look at our kp indices by the way we're still at 166 days of spotless from our sun for 2018 57 percent of the year without spots and taking a look at our kp indices at a zero with a 24-hour max of a one and right there where they have it uh, highlighted here uh, that is the coronal hole that should give us the possibility of a minor g1 uh, storm and this has been kind of the story with our star here lately um, we get these little storms 500 600 kilometers per uh, second and then that uh, kind of scales back down like right now we're in the low threes for uh, solar wind but we could expect to see uh, wind levels of around 500 or more kil uh, kilometers per second kilometers i'm sorry Take a look at our TSI reading for October, I believe this is for the 10th, yes, 1360.6645. Definitely going to check back in tomorrow. This is right around the time where we've seen landfall and I'm just trying to make a correlation between TSI and, sun, and our storm that we had last week and Michael. And let's take a look here at some very extreme rainfall deadly floods target spain worse sudden temperature drop as well so here we have another story about um, extreme swinging from one to the next extreme conditions are expected across the iberian peninsula and the balearic islands from october 18th through the 21st of 2018 these events follow devastating floods that claim 13 lives in malacora and another 13 in neighboring France over the past couple of days. There is potential for similar rainfall totals in extremely dangerous weather situation. So basically this is a repeat of what they've already had in this region and then some. Um, but the thing that's sudden that we wanted to point out, not just the 48 inches that they're expecting in 12 hours, some spots could see almost 12 inches as well in parts of Spain. Uh, lots of footage here from watchers.news. But the temperature drop is definitely something that they're really watching. It's one of the coldest uh, that they've, uh, they're calling this uh, record historic as far as the sudden swing and temperature drop. Uh, where was it at here? I look like it. Well, there was actually a spanish term for what this cold snap is going to do but uh forgive me folks i thought it had it in this information but again more rain and possible devastating floods also leading to the possibility of crop damage as well and i'll get more into that here in a little bit at least 45 people have been killed in niger since 2018 this is back as june when the region entered its rainy season Nearly 209,000 have been affected. And those numbers were made public by the Na United Nations on October 16th and are much higher than those government numbers. Uh, the rains destroyed nearly 17,000 homes and killed more than 33,000 livestock. Uh, over 22,000 acres of milled maize and beef fields were inundated. This is important because we're trying to point out some things right now here in our show tonight. And it's something that we don't really um, talk a lot about where we should because it's really starting to pile up here. Um, the, the flood situation here in Kingsland, uh, they have been just 
showered with rain over the over the past 40 this is yesterday's headlines but here we are talking about floods rivers and of course possible crop damage which leads me to a little bit of review here on some of the crop damage that we've seen here recently and I know crop damage happens every year and this article here was stating that um, you know Hurricane Michael crop estimates top well over 1 billion it's more like over 2 billion and this article out of the Dayton Daily News uh, does a really good job of breaking this down on what it means to us as far as how much money we're losing so 300 to 800 million dollars just in the cotton industry and uh, it was the second highest contributor to Georgia's farm gate value last year contributing just over seven percent the final loss estimate will be dependent on farmers ability to harvest what remains in the field now Georgia had the potential of record year yields for this year so this loss is even more devastating pecan trees uh, what's the big deal about this? $560 million of damage. Uh, this is a decade long type recovery for this industry. Uh, it says here that it takes about seven years for a, for a tree to produce uh, nuts. And there is a hundred percent crop loss in Seminole County, 85% in Decatur County, 30% in Grady County. Peach far uh, pe pecan farmers will take a decade to recover from the loss of of a mature tree and many of these farmers are still recovering from Irma when Michael rolled through um, and I've seen the pictures these trees are leveled snapped like twigs or uprooted so there is no saving any of this and when you hear things like well this is gonna take a decade to recover um, starting to add up a little bit take a notice here vegetables 480 million these are estimated numbers um, 25 million in the poultry industry, 5.6 per 2% in eggs, 10 million to 20 million in the peanut, in the peanut industry. Tourism, of course, is going to suffer a little bit. The corn mazes, the pumpkin patches, uh, you know, the school field trips, stuff like that. The family weekend stuff. Those are now affected as well. So here, you know, we've got. 480 there there's there's 1 billion to maybe 1.8 billion dollars so there's 1.8 billion dollars in crop loss and then the timber industry is at 1 billion dollars 1 million acres were destroyed and belonging to small or private landowners so right now we're close to 3 billion dollars on just the general assessment so far of Michael and hard to believe that it was eight days ago when it first made landfall but you know it's not just Michael but think about through the Carolinas right now where they've had to endure two hurricanes uh, a very horrible Florence who did a lot of damage and once again they're talking about um, North Carolina, the both North and South Carolina is how much um, they could actually get done. Yes, the governor of North Carolina warned about, I don't know, seven to 10 days out from the storm. And the situation was different with that. Um, Florence was churning out in the Atlantic. It took a long time to get to the coast, but we saw it and the, the track was more and more consistent. So this was a no brainer for the governor to call the uh, the harvest of the crops that were in the field. Not saying that this was an easy call. I mean, he made the right call. It could have been worse, though. Um, crop damage in South Carolina was estimated at $125 million so far. Uh, that was before they get flooded out again from Michael. This is just Florida estimates here. I'm sorry, Florence estimates. Um, and, you know, also North Carolina wants to make it known as well that this little farm bill is not going to do it it's not going to be enough north carolina remains the nation's largest tobacco producer with more than 330 million pounds in 2016. this year estimated losses could be around 125 million pounds so nearly half of their crops 
valued at 250 to 350 million. About 40% of the tobacco crop remained in the field during Florence. So you, there's where your loss comes from there. The 5,000 acres that Craig West Family Farms near Fremont, about 50 miles southeast of Raleigh, the biggest money maker is the 500 acres of tobaccos. 16 inches of rain made it uh, impossible to harvest. Leaves still in the feet at the time. And even if the winds hadn't battered them so that they were about as appealing and saleable as a bunch of bruised bananas, basically. Um, just devastating loss. Here's more agri or I'm sorry, more um, poultry loss here. 3.4 million poultry, 5,500 hogs at the point of this report. We got Tropical Storm Terra that's also threatening Mexico. That's actually happening. This was a couple days old. They're also facing floods, heavy rain, uh, high winds, and of course, crop damage as well with mudslides in the mountainous terrains. And then we have another article here in out of Minnesota talking about their crop loss and the the potential delay in the corn soybean harvest as the result of the rain. This is important because not only are we delaying the harvest right now, the most common thing that we've heard about what these farmers need is a week of dry weather to even get into the fields to start harvesting. But what I was going to say was that we had a late planting season because of ice and rain and snow and now we have a delayed harvest because of uh, mainly rain right now but remember guys iowa and minnesota had some rough weather uh, at the at the end of the winter last year so that delayed their planting and now with all the rain and snow they've gotten in the area it's delaying their harvest i hope you guys are seeing what i'm trying to say here um and of course Another farmer in India commits suicide. Uh, he owed the banks loans and relatives money to help keep his crop going. And of course, the weather has now um, wreaked havoc on his crop, losing all of it. And these people over there, and I'm sure every farmer, every farming family takes it this serious. Unfortunately, we see too many headlines in India talking about uh, a farmer committing suicide at an age like 50 years old, 54 years old. They list a couple others, one that was 40 years old on October 7th, September 24th, a 35-year-old farmer. Uh, the biggest problem that we're going to end up having here, guys, is, is not enough farmers to grow for our future. I mean, if you're a pecan farmer, let's just say you're a private owner right now, and you're a pecan far farmer, and the economy is already rough for you, you're struggling to make it work and you lose 10 years of your business. You know, how old are you? Are you going to be able to recover? Do you have enough time? Are, you know, is this going to put you out of business for good? So you have to start thinking about those things as well. And it's all adding up and it's part of that grand solar minimum effect. And we're at the beginning. And that's what I wanted to stress. I've done crop loss reports before where I'm all over the place trying to show you that crop loss is happening everywhere. Um, Ice Age Farmer does another uh, really good job at pointing out. He actually does a little more in depth about the crop loss. But we don't talk about it enough. And we probably should because I know last year I covered a lot of headlines talking about crop loss, crop loss, crop loss. And this year it's quietly piling up all over the United States. And unfortunately, the two hurricanes that made landfall that caused damage so far this year have affected the Carolinas both time as they're trying to clean up and move on with life. Uh, another 8 to 12 inches of rain fell in certain spots, creating more problems for getting the crop out of the field. Not everybody was able to get their crops out. Even though the governor had warned, it still takes manpower. It still takes time to do this. And the worst part about these storms, I think, not just, um, it's just the timing of where they hit. 
You know, that possibility lies every year when we have hurricane season. I understand that. But just the way these have impacted, and you look at places like Texas where they're underwater right now, Minnesota and Wisconsin's been underwater this year, and parts of Pennsylvania's been underwater this year, and North Carolina and South Carolina have been underwater a lot this year. Parts of northern Kentucky were underwater earlier this year. These flood, te- I mean, these flooded areas and this crop loss is going to start building up. And like Spain, on the last three weeks, they're getting two major storm systems dropping about 15 inches of rain in 12 to 24 hours. In some cases, that's four or five months of rain. So, you know, it's starting to become a concern, I think. And when you think back to the modern minimum and Dalton denim- and the Dalton minimums. But especially the modern minimum where we had the most famine, uh, I think. And, you know, some civilizations fell because of the modern minimum. And ancient ones before that as well. But the population that we're dealing with right now is way bigger than we've ever had. And I can't tell you right now, if this crop loss, and this is only the very tip of the iceberg of this, we are now descending in towards the grand solar minimum we're not in it yet this is just the beginning of effects of increased cosmic rays lower solar wind uh, lower activity on the sun from sunspots this is just the very beginning of this decline and we're weak and we're going to continue to be weaker on these solar cycles 25 maybe a really quick fast 26 and then 27 is that when we're going to see the worst of it? Maybe. A couple theories out there that work with that. But let's be clear on this, folks. We're still going to be descending towards that bottoming out. I'm not saying it's a guarantee. But I think a lot of the data that we see on this channel would point to a at least Dalton minimum type event. If not, modern minimum or a slightly worse. Possible. But the more data I look at, the more stuff I look at, guys, um, you know, I, I think it's feasible to think that 25 will be weaker than 24, obviously, 25 to 30% less. And then I think it'll be a short cycle and shorter on 26, also weaker by another 25, 35, 40% before we really descend to the bottom of that solar activity. Who knows? Time will tell. But one thing is definitely apparent. We are cooling. We are seeing things changing on a daily basis. And don't let it be, those global warming folks tell you out there that um, warmer temperatures hold more water vapor in the atmosphere. So that's why we're getting so much rain. Well, there's one thing they're forgetting to tell you about that fact. And that is you need particles to turn that water vapor into rain or snow. And right now <laughs> with the cosmic ray increase that we've seen and I I think it's pretty intense if you ask me and it's only at the beginning so you have more highly charged particles in the atmosphere that's why we're seeing 12 inches of rain in 24 hours because our atmosphere is an abundant right now with particles to form these raindrops snowflakes taking a look at NOAA Winter outlook favors a mild winter winter for temperatures much of the U.S. Now, they're not going to predict snow because it's just, I guess, not possible to predict long-term snow. I don't know. Farmer's Almanac does it. Um, other people I've seen on social media have predicted the winters. A lot of the forecasters are saying the same thing, except for Noah. And I'll get into that here in a second. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, NOAA.gov on Facebook, we had a little discussion back and forth. Uh, lasted 33 comments, so half and half, you go figure. But uh, I, I find it interesting that, once again, NOAA is coming out with a revised look at uh, what we're looking at for the winter. And it's got the Northwest looking like it's going to stay pretty warm um, this winter. Much of the West in the in the Plain States, the Northern Plains, are going to see a little bit more chance for above average temperatures this winter. Slightly above average in the Corn Belt here in Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, 
And then, of course, no change at all for the Mid-Atlantic and the South as far as temperatures. Interesting to see New England slightly above because everybody that has uh, seen these forecasts for this year's winter has seen um, lots of snow for the Northeast from basically the Great Lakes. Uh, let's see if I can get my circle here my little pointer basically from where this area starts right here this brown all the way down through here in the northeast is supposed to be cold and snowy but yet noah's saying it's going to be dry so this will be interesting to watch this year now we have kind of something to go against and grade but what i wanted to really show you guys is here we have like i said noah's changing their story about this winter it's going to be warmer now in most of the parts of the united states now the last part of this says NOAA seasonal outlooks give the likelihood that temperatures in the precipitation will be above near or below average and how drought conditions are expected to change. But the outlook does not project seasonal snowfall accumulations. Snow forecasts are generally not predictable more than a week in advance. Even during a warmer than average winter, periods of cold temperatures, now this is key, periods of cold temperatures and snowfall are still likely to occur. NOAA's Climate Prediction Center updates the three-month outlook each month. The next update will be on November 15th. So let's circle our calendars and set it in our reminders on our iPhones. But I wanted to show you guys this article here too. And you guys, I'll leave the link in the description. And this is talking about the adjustments that were made by NOAA and the UAH Global Temperature Updates. And by reading this article, from what I'm gathering here, is that NOAA basically biasly updated their data um, unjustifiably, basically cooking the books here. And the UAH is showing a much slower rate of warming than the NOAA forecasts, their new data set that they're using now, which is ERSST.V4. That's their new trend. And you guys can see it here in the red, how they've manipulated the data. They've almost doubled the, rate, the warming rate here from 2009 and beyond. Interesting to see. And all their charts also show how NOAA is higher and that the UHA is showing a much slower trend in the warming and also in the cooling. Nevertheless, just another article here for those folks out there at NOAA who want to try to act like that us normal regular folk out here don't understand how this all works. And NOAA is basically trying to say, I'm the big dog here and you're nobody. Uh, you're just a conspiracy theorist that gets all of your information from science climate blo climate blogs. But look, when the articles present the links and the data, I don't care if this comes from a advertisement. If the links to the peer-reviewed papers are there, if the data sets are also located, NOAA's and UAH and it's real time, actual, factual. To me, the proof is right in front of you. You make your own decision, you can look at it, but this is clearly showing how NOAA is trying to adjust temperatures to fit their agenda. And that kind of goes into this here about Trump and where here Anthony Watts is saying he's got the right to question climate change. Um, Contrary to Al Gore's assertion in his PBS video aired on October 12th that only a few outliers in the scientific community don't support the UN IPCC conclusions, there are many scientists who disagree with the UN on climate change. Indeed, it was an understatement for the president to say on the 60-minute interview that we have scientists who disagree with that. Disagreeing with man-made global warming is what he meant. In regard to the view that Greenland is melting significantly because of man-made climate change. In his October 8th lecture at the London-based Global Warming Policy Foundation, Pro Professor Richard Lindzen uh, referenced the finding by both NOAA 
and the Danish Meteorological Institute that the ice mass of Greenland has actually been increasing. And I actually kind of talked to Noah about that a little bit, and they acted like they had no idea what I was talking about. Many scientists agree with Lindzen and would applaud the president's answer to the question posed by Leslie Stahl. Do you think climate change is a hoax? As I said before, Trump responded, I think something's happening. Something's changing. It'll change back again. I don't think it's a hoax. I think there's probably a difference, but I don't know that it's man-made. Um, and this just goes on to talk about how um, it feels like it's an attempt to restrict uh, the fossil fuel industry, I get it. I understand why you have to have those undertones included in this article. But with that being said, while we have been under the Trump administration, and for all you Trump haters out there, I guess just go ahead and, and click on somewhere else. But U.S. greenhouse gas emissions have fell by 2.7% from 2016 levels, according to Andrew Wheeler at the EPA. Emissions on a per capita basis hit a 67-year low last year. Federal data shows and supporters are touting EPA's data as proof Trump's agenda is working. <laughs> Imagine that. EPA's new data comes on news that globally greenhouse gas emissions are set to rise historic highs by the end of this year, despite nearly 200 countries signing in this Paris Climate Accord. Um, impressive. Trump pulls us out of the climate accord and we end up finishing 2.7% lower than the rest of the world. Um, China is the main culprit behind rising emissions, but India and other developing countries contribute. However, recent reports have detailed how European countries aren't on track to meet their own emissions reduction goals. A recent report from the climate action Network Europe found that emissions cuts among the most EU members were nowhere close enough to meet the goals of the Paris Accord. Trump pledged to withdraw from the Paris Accord earliest as possible on the, in 2020. On the flip side, the U.S. led the world in emissions cut for the ninth time this century. According to the oil giant BP, there is another stat that I wanted to point out as well. A major reason the U.S. has been able to cut emissions is the availability of low-priced natural gas. This is true. In the last decade, drillers have been able to use hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling to unlock vast shale gas reserves. In this result, which an addition of wind and solar energy, uh, we are using less coal and other fossil fuels that provide CO2 into the environment. Um, Germany, by the way, who is missing its goals for 2020, that government will now push their CO2 goals back to 2030. So this whole idea of Trump questioning whether or not man-made global warming is real, and at the same time, he questions why climate change is happening, because his policies are, this is the greatest part, 2016 levels were higher, obviously. 2000, right now, we're talking about lower emissions, okay? And we're not even participating in this, this, this treaty. There is a balance, and this administration and the EPA are working together to find that balance. I know, I know what you're going to say. Well, we're lower. We're lower in CO2 and it's already getting cold out. Now, I can hear it now. The, the AGW crowd will, they'll pound the drum. We did it. We did it. We got, we got the temperatures down. We reduced emissions. Look, Donald Trump did it without even trying and look, it's cooler already. But yet, Noah's saying that it's going to be a warmer winter than normal. But CO2 emissions are falling in the United States. A 67 year low. That's impressive. But again, like I said, here we have a case of Noah and the actual numbers not matching up. How is Noah predicting a warmer 
based on their theories and their and their argument is is that man is causing global warming that co2 emissions are causing global warming so how is it that our numbers are going down in co2 emissions and yet we're actually getting a little bit cooler but on top of that noah's saying we're going to be warmer how's that work we have lower than the rest of the world and yet we're still warming Hmm. Draw that line for me there, Noah. I'm not convinced. You know, and the fact that they actually interacted with me for over 30 comments tells me that there was a little bit of damage control. And I believe that the story about a milder winter is more damage control because fortunately, I was able to spew a lot of truth. But the way Noah handled me is they were hoping they could bully me out of the conversation, bully me out of their website so I would stop spewing truth about solar minimums and the correlation between low solar activity and colder temperatures. They admitted that the, or they didn't admit, they told me that the lower atmosphere is warming up, is what they told me. Fact is what they said. But then I show them these numbers and they're telling me that I'm, they're going off of this trend i get that the trend looks like it's going up but i also just showed you guys how noah's speed of, of warming was almost doubled compared to what the uah is reporting and he's like well you're just taking you know a, a time period from 2016 and, and present to base that off of whether we're warming or cooling and that's just not how it works again time will tell but I just thought it was funny to me to like, it's almost like they're defending that narrative that we are still on the rise when actually we aren't. And thanks to this individual here, look at this guy's name. I think it's Bob Tisdale. Um, leave the link in the description, but you know, he, he breaks it down. He shows you where Noah is cooking the books. Okay. So when I see this story, all I can think back is the little discussion that I had with him about a week ago. And then I look at Bob Tisdale's article. <laughs> I, I mean, again, I don't care if this is a science blog. And this was from 2015. Okay. So this is not something new that's been happening between NOAA and UAH. It's not new. But this grossly demonstrates the overcooking, the fudging of the numbers that NOAA will deny. Of course they will. They're one of the biggest government-funded organizations that they admit, hey, we've cooked the books a little bit, guys. We, we had to make sure that we kept getting that taxpayer money to push the fear that you're killing the planet. It's all your fault. We're taking your money and we're making... I mean, think about it, guys. It's too late of return. I mean... How many scientists have made a career of working for NOAA based on taxpayer money? The lie was put into gear many years ago, 30 years ago, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it got to a point where it was like, we can't turn back. We've taken too much money. We've, we've, we've messed up too bad. We have to fight. We have to ride this out to the end. And like I said, I'm not going to be surprised. They're going to find a way to congratulate themselves when we do start our noticeable cooling right now we're just you know the, the climate's toying with us toying with us right now uh, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future but i can tell you right now this is just the beginning and anyone who can predict anything clearly in the next 10 years i think is mistaking because there's so much information and every time i look at something about this topic it makes me think well maybe it's 2030 and then there's other data sets that say it could be 2041 but what i'm saying is that we're still descending into the grand solar minimum i'm not saying that we're going to warm up and it's going to make the climate kind of balance out in between these cycles these two cycles coming up could be short and quick very much so so i just look at it and, and also think about how rome wasn't built in one day and these minimums just don't come overnight these take time. So I think the most important thing that we could all do at this channel and other people in the community that support other channels is just to continue to stay aware 
of your surroundings and keep an eye on stories about crop loss because sooner or later guys this is going to it's going to affect the local governments down there okay that's a trickle down effect so if it affects a region that's going to eventually be widespread and if this continues to happen every year like it's been happening the last two or three years we've noticed it a lot more the last two or three years anyway I mean, we're going to start feeling it in our pockets. So I think it's regardless of who's right and when the grant, it could be Grand Solar Minimum 2030. It could be 2041. It could be now. Either way, we do know from here into the next 20, 30 years, we know that our weather is going to go downhill and the temperatures are going with it. And that this whole nonsense about high CO2 and temperature rise will be put to rest eventually. Unfortunately, folks, we don't have the remedy for that overnight either. That's just going to take time as this develops. I wanted to show you guys our snowfall accumulation. Um, this is just, oh, this is the 24-hour one. I don't want that one. I want to show you guys the overall for the next few days. <laughs> Total snowfall. Here we go. So, I showed you guys earlier this month a forecast that looked like we were going to have some purples in the northeast. These totals have been scaled back. We're talking maybe one to three inches possible for most of the northeast, uh, even through parts of northeast Ohio, three inches of snow between now and the 25th of October. Uh, now we are seeing some amounts here in the northern part of or I'm sorry, the southern part of Kansas here on the east coast. And if you guys look at this region here, it's starting to build up. There is where the cold air is affecting. And the more snow cover we get up here, the colder air that is going to continue to filter down this way. Now, the northeast, in my mind, from actually this line's perfect. But this snow line, this edge line, all the way through the uh, northeast, this is where I think will be the colder part of the the winters is going to be in this region anyway okay we're still going to be cold over here the south is going to have some challenging information this year for sure uh, a lot more ice and possible snowfalls in the southern parts of tennessee northern georgia alabama and mississippi parts of south carolina as well but this right here is a perfect example this line that we're looking at right now is where i think that we'll see the most cold air and snowfall and look at what's happening in Canada right now. It's kind of like a foundation of that cold air and snow accumulation that is possibly coming towards this region. Um, it is being forecasted that the Northeast will, can, will have its cold winter. Nothing too crazy, if not right at average cold winter, but will be a little bit above average on the snow. So if these trends continue, it looks like that might take shape. Take a look at our GFS currently right now. Uh, not a lot to talk about except for Texas. You continue to see chances of rain over and over into the weekend in areas that don't need any more rain. Huge system moving across. A little bit of a cold front also as well. Ohio, you guys are going to see some snow showers, but this is going to be a quick event, so it's not going to accumulate. We haven't been below freezing enough. The ground's not frozen. So this is just going to be a blast of cold air through the Ohio Valley and those snow showers are quickly going to move through. Some lake effect is possible this weekend in western New York and central New York as well. So Lake Ontario and Lake Erie will be the culprits for that. And Erie, Pennsylvania, you guys are going to miss out on this event. More, meanwhile, high pressure will push all that off by the beginning of next week here. And we see pretty much um, all as well except for in the Gulf. We might have a little bit of a disturbance that gets kicking here in the Gulf near Houston and moves up through the Gulf Coast and once again brings rain to the areas in Texas where we don't need any more. Meanwhile, that chillier air sticks around in the Northeast. Another chance for some light snow for New York by the 24th of next week. That's a, that's a Wednesday. More chances for rain across the South as this next system moves out. Again, high pressure pushing it off and bringing with it this time, GFS Models is showing just a little bit of a warm up not much, though. We're talking 50s and 60s. as We're looking at high temperatures here in the northeast in the 40s. Uh, but it does indicate, once again, there's another low-pressure system raking the east coast on the 27th. That's two weeks from now, but still something to watch for as these heavier rain total amounts are just off the Atlantic. So any shift uh, to the west 
could spell more trouble again for North Carolina and South Carolina. Again, this is well out into the end of October where we look at a possibility of this low pressure system dominating the Midwest and the Northeast. And right now the temperatures are showing mainly rain and not snow. Uh, I will tell you this, that the models have changed just slightly. Uh, Halloween now expecting some snow showers in northern New York and also across the northern plains in Iowa, uh, Minnesota, parts of South Dakota and North Dakota, and more snow to the uh, Colorado, Wyoming upper elevations as well. But the next low pressure system to come through, again, temperatures are warming up. This is going to be mainly rain. Most of the snow will be in Canada, maybe some lake effect. For the first couple days of November as the temperatures would definitely drop and guys this this jet stream pattern right here look at this dip I mean this is in my eyes and I'm no expert but every time I saw the jet stream dip like this and bring the temperatures down like that that was usually an indication and right now it, it looks exactly like that situation in the Northwest where we've got rain and snow in BC and Alberta and the Northwest. But this little part of the high pressure, the cold front that's dipping down like a, like a sideways, like it almost looks like a cow's udder, the way this jet stream is shaped. This was always kind of a signature for Greenland blocking. And I was kind of looking at the overall picture here for temperatures in the elliptical view here for the entire world and i want you guys to watch this part right here this little bump right here in this region and if we watch this high pressure system here in greenland it's kind of camped out and is moving southwards now this only goes up to november 3rd but that dip right here in that region and i'll see if i can zoom this in for you guys here is that area that i was talking about that had that funny looking shape of a cold front coming in in the ohio illinois indiana area and possibly moving through the northeast um, that was originally thought possibility of like a polar vortex type situation for the northeast by the end of october but what we'll have to watch now is where this high pressure system is and does it continue to drift further uh, south at the tip of Greenland and if that sits up right here and stays this is an indication of what we call the Greenland blocking which will also bring in polar vortex and colder than usual air uh, temperatures than what we're used to seeing at this time of year any time of the year really now the only good news that I see is that if you look at the beginning and I'll slow this down a little bit if you look at the beginning of this map, as we get closer to the end, we don't see the purple showing up as much. In fact, at the very end, we've got just a lot of dark blue and teal type colors for as far as our cold Arctic areas. You look down in the south, tons of purple, light pink, super serious cold, super serial cold as Al Gore would say. So that's the only good news that I see about this potential Greenland blocking situation possibly happening. Possibly, I'm not saying it is. But it's a possibility the ingredients are there and that tells me that that first blast of cold air arctic air may not be as bad as it probably could have been say if this polar vortex had developed sometime like right around now as we see a lot more colder uh, frigid arctic air in place than we do but this is the beginning of that ridge where it kind of buckles up here in southern canada and the northern plains and again like i said i just remember seeing these kinds of anomalies during these Greenland blocks uh, and right now I could be off but it's a possibility it's something to keep our eyes on it's something that might develop into the second week of November and get our real first dose of really cold air it's possible I remember last December we got hit with some super cold air that we weren't expecting uh, as early as we got it so um, we've preached on this channel that these winters of getting worse are going to progress as the future keeps coming Take a look at ocean temps once again, not matching what we're seeing here. Although we are noticing a drop in the El Nino 3-4 index, it is now at plus 0.508 above um, baseline where we've been seeing values above the 8 region. So it is on the verge of back to neutral again. So we'll just keep our eyes on that 
and see if temperatures spike back up and continue to trend towards a weak El Nino for this year. And the North Atlantic anomaly temperature right now is on the rise, but it's still below baseline, but just barely. And taking a look at our current radar, uh, like I said earlier, Texas, unfortunately, um, no relief for you guys in sight. I'm trying to clean up the mess that you have right now, and we still have showers and storms moving across. Not as bad as we've seen in the past. Uh, Oklahoma City just missing the action for now as that continues to move northeast at this current time. But other than that, guys, pretty quiet. Uh, no moisture or anything like that uh, to really speak of in the south. Just a few showers near Corpus Christi in the Gulf. And if we go up here into the mountainous areas of Colorado, maybe some light snow showers and up into the northwest corner, we have very light rain uh, falling near Seattle, uh, Yamaka, and uh, also near Portland. So other than that, guys, pretty quiet. And with that being said, uh, I'd like to um, get Mari over here and say hello to everybody in the chat. Of course, we thank everybody who tunes in. Thank you, Jake. I know I won't pull on the mic, Jake. Don't you worry. <laughs> Everyone can see you and your reactions to me as I talk. Should I test them out, folks, and see if we can I make them make funny faces? Okay. Anyway, we're having a great conversation in the chat. As always, we have loads of awesome people. Uh, Radical Gardener was in there. Equa was in there. Miss C. Gypsy Carlton's. Uh, doing some interesting research on petroglyphs and the plasma universe, which I always find fascinating. Thunderbolts Project does a great job covering a lot of that. Um, lots of people sharing stuff about gardening tips and weather in their area. It's just such a great community to you know bounce ideas off each other. Equa shared an idea about using like eggshell halves for seed starters and stuff and how the eggshell is really beneficial to the soil as calcium all that so you know neat stuff uh so thank you guys for joining us every night in the chat it's such a pleasure thanks mari and no rob, no rob. rob. <laughs> <laughs> he's allowed to have a night off every once in a while okay. um you know and i and I'm, I'm glad mari mentioned that you guys are talking about gardening in the chat um, and I think there's a really great um, ideas in the chat on gardening and tips. And I also think it's time we start thinking about moving this operation indoors. Um, this year, definitely worse than 2017, obviously worse than 16 as well. But the frequency of extreme weather that we're seeing with the sudden temperature swings being, you know, 80 degrees one day and then 42 hours later, it's in the upper 30s. Uh, the extreme rain that we that we see on a normal basis now, uh, not just a half inch to a qu three quarters of an inch, but three to five inches of rain falling sometimes in certain areas. Uh, no crop's going to survive that. So I guess it's, you know, we've gotten the practice out of growing outdoors. And now I think it's time that we start coming up with um, some unique and helpful ways to growing indoors and really seriously thinking about getting that operation starting sooner than later because i'm not trying to be a debbie downer i'm just stating what i'm seeing the articles that i read on a daily basis and the amount of crop loss due to extreme weather from what appears to be this upcoming grand solar minimum so all right guys that's going to do it for us tonight we appreciate everyone who had tuned in tonight. We hope you got something from the video. Uh, we will talk soon, guys. Take care.